Darrell Castle, I think you all know him well. He's the vice chairman of the party. He was the vice presidential candidate for the Constitution Party in 2008. He's a successful lawyer with offices in Memphis and Kansas City. And uh, he uh, runs a, presents a uh, radio a blog. He, uh, he does many wonderful things in speaking for the party, many radio and TV interviews and shows that, he, that he's been on. And uh, you've heard him before. We hear him again. He and his wife, Joan, do so much in making this all possible. So, uh, Daryl, take it away. Well, thank you, and thank you for, uh, for bearing with us through this. War and famine, it's a good topic for just before lunch. Uh, but uh, why don't we start out by saying something like this. In the third year of the reign of Obama Caesar, war and famine have spread across the entire world in a world where hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent since World War II to eliminate third world poverty. This is where we are today. This is actually another journey through the Middle East in a way. And uh, it's not a geographic journey this time, but it's a look at these two subjects in the Middle East. In fact, it would be fair to say that in the Middle East, war and famine, it's just business as usual. And as they say, business is booming. Uh, this is the Middle East, obviously. Uh, you can see uh, the United States <clears throat> has many friends there, it thinks, uh, and a few enemies too. But I want to concentrate on one area today of the Middle East, uh, an area that we know as the Holy Land, holy because Jesus was there. This is Israel uh, and a few other places you can see. Uh, Israel, uh, it's hard to, uh, to see on this map, but that spot that looks white, uh, the large white area, and the smaller one down on the, on the Mediterranean coast are the Palestinian areas <clears throat> in Israel, what they call Palestine. So uh, you've all, you're all familiar with uh, what's happened recently in the UN, but I remind you, one year ago in September, uh, last September a year ago, President Obama stood before the General Assembly of the United Nations and expressed his strong support for, for a Palestinian state. And uh, this year that kind of uh, turned around and bit him because uh, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, <clears throat> Mr. Mahmoud Abbas, called his hand and said he was going to submit an application to the UN for statehood. And President Obama tries as he, as he could. Uh, he, spent special, he sent special envoys to, uh, to the Middle East many times trying to persuade this man not to make the application. But still, uh, he stuck to his guns. And so this year, uh, he had to do something extraordinary, President Obama, that is, or he would have been terribly embarrassed. Uh, by having to veto uh, this resolution because uh, th that would have upset the Israelis. You can't have that, especially with an election year coming up. So it's a choice of uh, appear to be a lying hypocrite or uh, spend some money or lose the election. Uh, so guess what happened? I think we spent some money. But uh, regardless, the uh, Palestinians agreed to, uh, to hold off. Now, World Net Daily, Joe Farris site, uh, reports that uh, Abbas told them, Farris said this in one of his columns, that Abbas told him that uh, Bush, <laughs> uh, a Freudian slip, I guess, that Obama uh, had said that if he would just hold off on this application to the Security Council until after 
uh, he was reelected, that he would get his full support for it. So we'll see what happens. But I thought we could talk a little bit today about who these Palestinians are and where they came from and uh, how all this conflict started. See, my theory is that uh, this new world order that you hear so much about today, call it whatever you will, but at the end of World War II, the plans were laid for all this, for the things that are happening today. And everything is just coming to fruition at the same time. I mean, it was the United Nations after World War II who came into what we know as Israel today, where all this conflict was, coming out of World War I, when the British said uh, we would look with favor upon the establishment of a Jewish homeland uh, in the Middle East. Well, that was the Balfour Declaration that we talked about once before. But once this started and all these Jews started immigrating into this land and pushing these people out, these Palestinians, uh, there was tremendous conflict and open warfare broke out and uh, uh, the, uh, the United Nations came in and appointed a committee. And this committee actually formed, they pushed the Palestinians into these two areas. Uh, they've changed over the years, but the Gaza Strip right there, we call it the Gaza Strip because of the city of Gaza. Uh, and then this is the West Bank, the West Bank of the Jordan that cuts through Jerusalem. And uh, that's been expanded and, it, you know, it periodically shrinks and so forth. And the, uh, the people in Gaza lob a few uh, rockets into Israel and Israel takes a few tanks into Gaza and blows up their uh, homes and so forth. Periodically, these things happen. Well, uh, the United States, uh, as we did in Southeast Asia, if you were... Uh, at uh, Fort Worth, we talked about this. At the end of World War II, the United States was kind of uh, assigned to, uh, to fight yellow people for 25 more years uh, in Vietnam and other places in Southeast Asia. And the British were in the Middle East, but just as the French had problems at Dien Bien Phu, and we were happy to take over their role uh, as colonial powers there and struggle on with this war, for 60,000 more dead. When the British had problems in Palestine in 1948, we were happy to assume their problems, which now we still have. Uh, we extricated ourselves from the Far East, or were extricated, I guess you could say, but we're still trying to solve these other problems, these problems of the Palestinians. Now, the uh, Gaza is run by an organization called Hamas, and many people think it's a terrorist organization, but it would be fair to say whatever your belief system that it's an organization that believes very strongly in violent jihad as the only solution. Uh, whereas the uh, West Bank is run by an organization called the Palestinian Authority, a little bit milder, a little more compromising. And the West Bank uh, the, the Israelis have expanded into the West Bank periodically for this entire time. About 350,000 Israelis live there now. And uh, so there, it's, the idea of statehood is pretty difficult to imagine if you count both those areas because Hamas says that they would absolutely not accept any two-state solution and they want nothing to do with the UN, which in one sense is pretty smart for them, I guess, but uh, still, warfare has gone on in the Middle East for 4,000 years, I guess. Uh, 4,000 years. We've only been involved in it for about 65. Uh, so if you look at the sweep of history, perhaps there's a long way to go. But uh, war and more war is what seems to be in our future. This organization that came to us in 1945 promising us uh, a place to sit down and reason together and prevent these types of things has caused a world that's been almost totally at war now for 65 or 70 years. I don't understand why we can't see that. 
and the other organizations that are offshoots of it. This recent conflict we had, uh, that if you might call it the uh, Arab Spring or these revolutionary movements that spread across the Middle East, they turned out to be bad news for Israel because the only peace that's ever happened there since World War II of any lasting significance was uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, treaty that he uh, brought about in 1979 with uh, uh, Menachem Begin from Israel and Anwar Sadat. If you remember, some of you are old enough to remember, he brought them all to Camp David and they entered into an accord where uh, the United States agreed to not only pay Israel, but to pay everybody to stop fighting, which is actually pretty smart because it's a lot cheaper than actually fighting. Uh, so Israel, since 1948, the United States has given Israel $120 billion that uh, is official on the record money. And it continues to give Israel $2.5 billion every year in official on-the-record money. Now, there's a lot of other money uh, that aren't count that's not counted in that, like uh, extra military aid when they're actually at war, emergency aid, things of that nature, plus interest on the money. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but all money today is debt in some fashion. It's created as debt and it has to be paid back with interest, whether you borrow it or not. That's the system that we have, so that's also a contribution in many other ways, but two and a half billion dollars officially every year. And since this peace treaty, we've been giving um, Egypt two billion dollars a year. Uh, and we also pay the Turks not to fight the Israelis. Well, all that's breaking down now, these, are these agreements. Uh, part of that agreement was the Egyptians agreed to, uh, to close this border between Gaza and Egypt, which Israel was very concerned about because the, they would pass back and forth, these Palestinians, and when they came back from having gone forth, they, uh, sometimes they had weapons with them. And uh, the Israelis didn't like that, so they bottled up this whole place and they uh, uh, blockaded the coast sealed off all these uh, exits, and these people have just been kind of uh, concentrated there, to use that term. Well, that border's open again now since Egypt changed leadership. Egypt's had three leaders since 1952. Three military officers have uh, led that country that entire time. Well, Mubarak's gone now, as you probably know, and a coalition of Air Force and army officers are trying to run the country and they're holding on to power desperately. Well, this is where we are now and in talking about a Palestinian state and what it would mean is probably going to happen sooner or later and the Israelis position on it is it doesn't mean anything for us. Uh, all you're going to have is a sovereign state that's occupied by another sovereign state because we're not leaving. Uh, the, the West Bank. So you have this conflict between the settlers in the West Bank, the Israelis who have moved in there, uh, and the Palestinians who live there. Well, this is uh, Jordan over here, and that used to be called Transjordan when it was first formed. All this sand was divided up with these invisible lines on the map by the British after World War II, Transjordan, now just Jordan. Why don't they take the Palestinians and absorb them? Well, they just don't want to. As uh, my best friend when I was in school one time, uh, it's a legend in our family, but uh, the teacher asked him why he didn't do his homework, and he said, I just never wanted to. Uh, so that's, that's the reason uh, the Jordanians and the Egyptians give for not absorbing these people. They are Arabs, but uh, when, uh, when the Jordanians or the Egyptians issue passports uh, to Palestinians, they're not Jordanian and Egyptian passports. They say Palestinian on them. Uh, so they really are stateless people in the classic sense of the word. Nobody wants them. Uh, but uh, the Arabs all want them to have their own state for some reason. Anyway, what is the solution to this problem? What 
can be done to solve this age-old problem? Uh, how can we bring peace? If you remember, every president, it's a rite of passage. He has to go to the Middle East. He has to send his Secretary of State, his, his Hillary Clinton, uh, to the Middle East to bring peace because uh, so many times that's the defining moment in a president's life. Did he bring peace in the Middle East or did he ignore it? Uh, and Jimmy Carter had some success for a few years uh, and it's starting to break down now. I don't know of a great deal of success since then, but uh, how can it be solved? Well, in a word, it can't. It can't be solved. It's impossible. Uh, and that's just the, the cold hard facts of it for several reasons. Number one, this is the, uh, on the left you see the symbol of Hamas. On the right you see the Palestinian flag. And uh, this symbol the, the, that the Hamas flies on their flag speaks volumes about why this problem cannot be solved. For example, if you look at the uh, symbol right there, that is the whole nation of Israel, including the Palestinian territories. And you notice uh, there's nothing there, it's all white. Well, that's because they say that when their state finally comes, it won't have any Jews in it. And they don't recognize and will never recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. This is a real problem. Uh, and it's an unsolvable problem. Here on each side you see the Palestinian flag uh, with some jihadist type uh, uh, writing on it. And these two swords represent their undying commitment to violent jihad as the only method to free Palestinian land. This building in the middle is the uh, mosque in uh, Gaza, the third holiest uh, uh, Muslim place. But uh, so those are reasons, and, and this language is uh, Muslim Brotherhood type stuff, as best I can tell. Uh, the Hamas was combined with uh, the PLO after Yasser Arafat died in 2004. Now, and that brings me to the next reason why it can never work. And that is uh, demographic problems in Israel. For example, you know, we've got our own demographic problems here in the United States. We're, we're getting older. Uh, 60 million people are on Social Security now, and another 78 million are scheduled to join their ranks in the next few years. Who will pay for all of it? Uh, more on that later, perhaps. But the point is, in Israel, they've got demographic problems. You know, uh, Arafat used to say uh, that his greatest uh, weapon was the womb of the Palestinian women. That means that uh, they're reproducing a lot faster than the Israelis, uh, much faster. And Israel has a lot of other troubles as well along those lines. Their population is really not growing anymore. Uh, they're down to about 20,000 people a year immigrating in. You know, the British tried to stop uh, Jewish immigration into Israel, but it didn't work. Uh, and for whatever, because of the violence or, or the economy is not what it used to be there. Um, you know, Israel, you think of these scenes of, of them planting the desert, you know, the, making the desert bloom, and those are true. This, actually uh, happens, but only about two and a half or three percent of their economy is actually agriculture. And what else do they have? Well, a large uh, natural gas deposit has just been discovered in, in the uh, uh, near offshore here. 25 trillion recoverable feet. If Tom Holmes were here, he could tell us whether that's a lot or not, because I used a figure like that once and he came up to me later and said, you know, Daryl, that, that's not really much gas. <laughs> but uh, 25 trillion feet, I think, is a lot. Uh, but they only produce about 100 barrels of oil a day. These are all problems for Middle East. Now, they, there's 250 
billion known uh, non-recoverable barrels of oil in uh, shale and other um, uh, methods under their soil. But as I said, it's not economically, uh, uh, economically feasible to extract it. So there's one more reason, and uh, it may be the biggest of all the reasons, and that is that uh, these two people share Jerusalem. And the Israelis, uh, many of them at least, look at Jerusalem as their, their historic capital. They're never going to give it up, never, not uh, while they live anyway. And the Palestinians feel the same way. They're never going to surrender Jerusalem. The problem simply can't happen. It can't be solved. That's not to say that we shouldn't try. I mean, presidents always try and they always give them more money. We pay, we pay the uh, Egyptians, the Turks, and the Syrians to pretend that they're friends with the Israelis. Uh, I wonder what would happen. Oh, and here's another thing. This money that we give the uh, Egyptians, much of it uh, comes back to America because uh, they use a lot of that, weapon, uh, that money to buy American weapons from American defense contractors. So in a way, what goes around comes around. We pay both of these people to arm themselves, and then we pay them not to fight. <laughs> it's, just, it, it's ridiculous, but true. Uh, these deals are breaking down because of this Arab Spring, but we're still paying them to this point because uh, we want to be on the winning side, I suppose. Well, that's my uh, explanation of why this can't work. But we keep trying. But now, uh, uh, we move a little bit further south. But in doing that, you can see the close relationship between these countries. Uh, Turkey up here, Israel right here, Syria, and all these borders. I wanted you to see how all these borders come together in this geographic area, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, all right together. And uh, of course, you know our history in Iraq and uh, the problems that we're having with Iran right now. But uh, moving a little bit further south, we're going to come to the second aspect of this, uh, this speech. We've talked about war to a certain extent, and there's lots more war to talk about. But uh, we need to talk about uh, fam famine for a few minutes as well. This is one of the uh, most important areas in the world, believe it or not, uh, right now. It's nothing but a bunch of sand and rocks really, but uh, it's become one of the most strategically important parts of the entire world, and the United States is heavily engaged here, fighting and otherwise. Um, this technology is not really my strong suit. Uh, this is Yemen, and this is Somalia. These two countries the United States has opened recently drone bases in, you know what those are. Uh, some some uh, kid in Arizona flies this uh, unmanned aircraft over uh, Somalia and sees somebody down on the ground through a satellite eye and sends a Hellfire missile down on top of him. That is essentially what it is. And hopefully that guy on the ground is bad. Uh, this is what... Uh, are being built all across the Horn of Africa and in Yemen, bases to man and house these things. We have 6,000 of them now uh, at a cost of about $4.5 million each, which is beer money for the military, I know, but sometimes it seems like a lot. Well, this is Somalia and Yemen on the top. Now, this I need to pause for a second and tell you that two organizations that were formed out of... Uh, World War II, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank are also heavily engaged in this area, as they are everywhere that there's debt. Uh, they're trying to make these countries into developed nations so that they're so heavily impoverished and indebted 
that they'll never recover for the rest of history. Then they would be developed like us. But uh, the point is, uh, at the end of World War II in the Bretton Woods Conference, uh, the International Monetary Fund was formed for the purpose of preventing economic crises like the world had just gone through. No more Great Depressions, in other words. That was the assigned mission of the International Monetary Fund, to intervene around the world when it saw economic trouble. Intervene with money, money contributed by the taxpayers of the contributing nations. Now, the United States can control the International Monetary Fund anytime it wants to because uh, it controls, it contributes 17 percent, and so it has 17 percent of the votes. It takes 85 percent to do anything, 85 percent agreement. So, anytime uh, we vote no, the answer is no. Uh, now, the, the deal was, this gentleman's agreement was that a European would always run the International Monetary Fund. Europeans like now, uh, Christine Lagarde from France, before her, you know, Dominic Strauss-Kahn, before he was deposed by uh, a maid in New York City. But uh, uh, Miss Lagarde has been very forthcoming and out uh, uh, out front with her view on third world debt uh, and the problems that we're going to look at here in a minute. She says that not one penny of debt will ever be forgiven. Not one cent, she said, for these people. They're in debt forever because they can't pay it. And you know what they say about debt that can never be paid. It won't be paid. Uh, but still, this is what she says. Well, that's the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank formed at the same time was to be run by an American. It's had some, some famous uh, uh, heads like Robert McNamara. Uh, you remember him from the Kennedy years and the Vietnam years. He's the one who instigated our uh, incursion into Vietnam and then later said, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it was all a big mistake, he said. Um, well, he ran the World Bank for a long time. And he's the one, the World Bank, by the way, had the mission when it was formed of uh, rebuilding war-torn Europe and other places around the world uh, that uh, needed money from the victorious allied nations, what was the ones who had money, and guess who that was? Uh, that was the United States, because the United States contributes more than 50% of the funds that the World Bank uses our tax money at, went, at work. Well, uh, the war-torn world was quickly rebuilt. In fact, within 25 years, Japan was one of the top five economies in the world. Uh, so what do you do when you have all this money and your mission is accomplished? Well, you just redefine your mission. So McNamara said that uh, the World Bank's new mission was to eradicate global poverty. And these two uh, nation, these two organizations kind of redefine themselves. He said, eradicate global poverty. Well, uh, as we'll see in a minute, they've done a tremendous job of that. Uh, and the IMF redefined its mission as intervening in third world debt crisis. Anytime they saw debt in the third world, they had to intervene to make it worse. Uh, <laughs> This is what's happened over the years. You know, like I've said many times, there's no problem that government can't make worse. <laughs> but what they've done to these two countries, uh, Yemen and Somalia, uh, Somalia was once self-sufficient in food until in the, about 1970, Somalia actually exported food, uh, especially cattle, which the Saudis bought a lot of their cattle uh, they were self-sufficient in food. Their people lived out in nomadic villages and stuff, so forth. Now, most of them live in Mogadishu and other uh, large cities. You remember Mogadishu from the Black Hawk Down uh, case. It's really just one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Uh, my daughter works with Somali refugees a lot, political refugees, and 
they're really fine people. We met some of them a couple of trips to Washington ago. But um, what's happening to these people now? Well, first of all, up here in Yemen, the International Monetary Fund just gave them $370 billion in August, on top of $2 billion recently by the World Bank. Same thing's happened down in Somalia. Well, why do you think they gave them this money? Uh, to help them meet their deficit. They're in deficit spending because they have no economy. Uh, there, there's no way they can possibly pay that money back. Uh, but still, it was to help them meet their deficit. In order to do that, in order to get this money, they had to make certain changes in their country. They have to agree to tax their people more heavily. People who, as we'll see in a few minutes, are starving. Uh, have to be taxed more heavily, a sales tax they wanted, a heavier sales tax, because 80% of their people ignore the income tax. 80% don't pay it. Um, because for one reason, they have no income. Uh, that's a, that's a, a real problem on the income tax. But anyway, they, they instituted these, uh, have come to be known as austerity uh, measures for these two countries. Now, keep in mind, that these may be the two poorest countries on the face of the earth. Uh, really, it's unimaginable what, what's happening there. But still, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank comes in and they have no solution except to loan whatever warlord or dictator uh, runs it money, which comes primarily from us and which can't be paid back. It's debt to us and them. It's a double debt. Um, now, in addition, uh, Yemen at least has a government. If you remember their, their dictator, Mr. Selah, who had gone up to Saudi Arabia four months ago and hung out with the Emirates and other uh, Saudi royals, just came back the other day. He has the Saudi blessing now to take back over his country, which is at, at war, one side wants him back, one side doesn't want him back. But still they have a government, and believe it or not, they have a central bank, which has the, uh, the mission of protecting their currency. These central bankers uh, have really done well at accomplishing their assigned missions and tasks over the years. But in Somalia, there is no central government. It's nothing but a collection of warlords who run it. Uh, the most powerful group is this uh, uh, Al-Qaeda-connected group called Al-Shabaab, who controls the entire southern third of the country. And as a result, you know, the term Al-Shabaab means youth, or youth movement. Uh, and these people, these Somalis, uh, as I said, once lived in villages all crowded into the cities like, uh, what, what was the illustration the lady gave the other day with the fish? You know, uh, I think that was Cynthia that gave the illustration of the fish being fed. Well, it's too horrible here to, to use that. But in effect, that's what is happening. These people who were once self-sufficient now are totally, completely, 100% dependent. I mean, uh, they're literally starving by the hundreds of thousands. And... They crowd into these refugee camps to be fed. And Al-Shabaab, this, this jihadist group, preys on these people and raids the relief columns, forces them back out of the, out of the refugee centers into the, the countryside. Why? Well, they say that they're, you know, they're easier to control out there. Now, and Al-Shabaab does have some relief efforts on its own. But still, it's a horrible situation. And right here on the Kenyan border, uh, these, th there's constant warfare going on between Kenyan troops and, uh, and, and the Somalis. 1,000 Somalis a day flee across the border into Kenya. And there's a refugee camp in Kenya, uh, 50 miles from the border, basically. Um, Dabib, I think it's called. Uh, it's one of the largest cities in the Middle East. 
It's nothing but a big collection of people who are all starving. Hundreds of thousands of people are there. It's like the second largest city in Kenya. It's the biggest refugee center in the world now. But uh, uh, this is what uh, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations, and others have accomplished in these two countries. Uh, this is the, the famine that I told you I was going to bring you. This is where we, the United States, our people, are fighting a war right now. Many others, 120 countries, the last reliable estimate I saw of where we're actually engaged in combat, but we have these drone bases there to attack these pirates and, and Al-Qaeda people. We have to kill them so they won't kill us. And the more of them we kill, the more of them there are in a never-ending cycle of war and famine and misery and despair. Um, but let me show you the next slide. This is Somalia and Yemen on the map, but this is actually Somalia. There it is, folks, the fruits of your labor, your tax dollars at work. Take a good look at it. Um, I can't leave the Middle East without talking about more war, one of my favorite subjects. You know, uh, in the things that I do, as I mentioned yesterday, the, the platform, other things that I do, the podcast, that type of thing, uh, the thing that I have to defend the most is uh, my position that uh, war is something that we should try to avoid whenever possible. A lot of people just simply don't agree with that, and they see it as, uh, as a solution that we should engage in very rapidly. Well, Somalia has absolutely nothing to offer us, nothing. It's got no mineral wealth, it's got nothing. Just a bunch of starving people. What do you do about it? I mean, how could you feed those people? Uh, absent a full invasion, I don't see any way to do it. Um, these are the conditions that war oftentimes uh, starts. You know, you start the ball rolling downhill and it just happens. Well, here we are in Afghanistan uh, into our 11th year. We just passed our 10th anniversary. Now, again, I'll mention to you that in World War II, the United States, and of course, a few of its allies, but primarily us, defeated Nazi Germany, the Japanese Empire, and the Italians in less than four full years. We brought them to a condition of unconditional surrender, left their cities a nuclear wasteland, uh, and then we formed banks to rebuild them very quickly so that they could sell us stuff and on credit and buy our debt. But the point is, We've been in this uh, country for more than 10 years fighting these barely out of the Stone Age type people because those are the people that we fight now for some reason. But Afghanistan, unlike Somalia, does have something to offer because we know now that it has great mineral wealth, all kinds of different things that we've discovered there that are valuable. But more than anything else, uh, it's got rocks and sand and death, misery, and destruction. And uh, that seems to be very attractive to us right now. By the way, I don't think we're leaving there anytime soon. Uh, and the reason I say that, the president says we are. He says, uh, uh, he says uh, we'll be out by Friday or something like that. Um, no, he, he actually says our, our presence will be reduced to just a handful of people by, by uh, the end of this year. Well, that's not going to happen. And the reason I say that is because, number one, it's virtually impossible unless you're, you're Ron Paul or me. And I agree with <laughs> Dr. Paul. You know, we just march in. We can just march out. Uh, but um, the reason I say that is because in Iraq, 
we are expanding this billion dollar complexes of embassies that we built. This gigantic embassy now, I've never been there. Some of you guys might have been there, I don't know. Um, but uh, uh, this gigantic embassy that we built uh, in Baghdad at a cost of a billion dollars, it has 10,000 um, Blackwater type uh, contractors, mercenaries, whatever you want to call them, guarding it on the inside along with all the other people who made it, 10,000. And uh, on the outside, it has 15,000 American military troops guarding it. Well, we're, we have three more of those under construction now in, in Iraq. Why would we do that if we're leaving? Um, not much makes sense, but that makes no sense. Another reason, we've expanded the war in Iraq, I mean in Afghanistan and, and in Pakistan. Um, here, all up through here, uh, just announced recently, we've expanded the, uh, the drone campaign all through there uh, to, to um, uh, a greater need. We have even greater need for people. So those are some reasons. Um, the other reason, the third reason, that I don't think it's going to happen is just simply history. It, it never happens. We talk about it, but we don't do anything about it. I mean, think about it. We fought the Germans. That's when we were fighting white people. Uh, we fought these white people, and we defeated them and brought them to, 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 to unconditional surrender. We firebombed their cities. Uh, and uh, we did that in less than four years, but we're still there. We've still got several thousand troops there, uh, supposedly to keep the, the Russian army from rolling these tanks across the plains of Europe, which is absolutely no threat whatsoever now, but we're still there. Uh, in Japan, Japan's off the grid now, but we're still there. We still have bases there. I, I don't know, maybe they're contaminated now. In Korea, we fought there only six years after the end of uh, World War II, we're still there. These are uh, historical examples of why I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, so uh, the Middle East, that's it for the Middle East. Um, this area that, right here that we looked at before, going into the uh, Arabian Sea uh, from the Persian Gulf, right there, that little oil choke point. I want to mention to you in passing that um, the Fifth Fleet is still in there, which is a, call, uh, a great concern for me personally, because this is the uh, home port of the Fifth Fleet. I wouldn't want to be in there if that uh, choke point were closed off. What can be done about all this? Uh, what could we do? Uh, well, there are a lot of things we could do. Um, number one, let me tell you in advance as I close, I don't want to leave you as I always say in total despair, uh, but it's too late to save the American economy, in my opinion, way too late. Uh, when I say save, I mean without a great deal of pain. There is no way that we're going to escape from, from this without going through the valley. The question is, what will the valley be like and what will emerge on the other side? Uh, because time goes on, empires rise and they fall. I'm sure when the barbarians were at the gates of Rome, the Roman emperor was saying, folks, everything's okay. It's just like it was yesterday. Uh, well, that's what we're told today. We're in recovery. But um, I do believe that we're going to go through a serious valley. Uh, we could structure it so that it was far less painless. Uh, if we don't, it's going to be worse than 1930. Um, what are some of the things we could do? Well, we could come home. Come home, mind our own business, protect our own country, take care of our own affairs, feed our own people. Right. 
I submit to you today that uh, to do otherwise while these calamities are, um, are upon us is worse than negligent. It's immoral. Uh, it's immoral to tell people that uh, their Social Security that they've paid for is going to have to be cut and other things that you have in a dependent society when you're fighting these nonsense wars and spending trillions doing it. And when Ben Bernanke finally admits to Congress, thanks to uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, he admits that he just gave $16.1 trillion, most of it to foreign banks and corporations, he just, just gave it to them. Uh, and he's still doing it. This $2 trillion that has recently been approved to bail out uh, Greece and other uh, European banks. Where do you think that comes from? Two trillion euros, actually, not dollars. Um, so it's immoral to do those things uh, and not do anything domestically. Uh, secondly, the U.S. monetary system is totally corrupt and has to be changed. Nothing else will solve our problem, nothing. Nothing will even touch it. See, folks, look, if, if there were no Federal Reserve, there would be no uh, incursions into the Middle East because we would have to pay for it with real money. Uh, if there were no Federal Reserve, there would be no money to give the International Monetary Fund, and uh, there would be a lot fewer children like we just saw. See, when you go to the store to buy a loaf of bread and it costs you $3.50, and you go the next day, and it's $4. Well, you might raise an eyebrow, but it's not going to ruin your life. But when you survive on nothing but a handful of rice every day, it's, it's life-changing. So if you're a uh, hard money man like I am, that's why I wore this gold tie today, then you believe that we should be on a gold standard. That's what I think. But there are many other uh, systems that would work far better than what we have now. I believe uh, that a gold standard, I'm okay with getting there gradually, but I'm not okay with ending the Federal Reserve gradually. The whole, uh, de the whole debt, debt base, the debt based monetary system has to be changed. Why should we create money? as debt and then pay these people for it. Why should we do that? Does that make any sense? Um, but that's what we do and it's what we've been doing now for 98 years. Uh, and no one will even listen to the possibility that it could be different. Um, now, um, what is the third thing we can do? Well, you've heard a lot about the budget this weekend since you've been here. As I said, it's too late to save uh, the economy, in my opinion. But there are things we could do that must be done. The Democrats approach the budget differently than the Republicans. The Democrats don't want to do anything. They like it. I mean, they like debt. They want more of it. Uh, they want the debt to be higher. They don't want to cut anything. They just say the real problem is we haven't spent enough. We haven't borrowed enough money. That's seriously what they say. Well, the Republicans look at it differently. They say, uh, let's try to determine the mood of the country and tell people that we're actually doing something, but we're really not. Uh, we'll do it just the same way. You could think about it like this. The Democrats would send the patient home and tell him he's okay. Uh, the Republicans would use a very tiny scalpel to extract a little bit of fat but I'm afraid that uh, a chainsaw is about to be forced on us, whether we like it or not. Uh, a chainsaw is going to be taken to this economy, and that includes everything, uh, defense included. Because we could save a trillion dollars by just coming home. That seems like a no-brainer. Uh, but everything, this economy is sooner or later going to solve these problems for us as to what we spend money on because uh, there will be no more money. And we have a chance to, to manage this. You know, uh, 
years ago when I used to go to every baseball game that I could, uh, when I had more time, I heard a player say one time in Memphis, uh, at that time our double-A team was in Omaha. No, the triple-A team was in Omaha. We had the double-A team for the Kansas City Royals. This player had uh, had come through Memphis and, and on his way up uh, to Kansas City, had had his career and now was at Omaha. And his answer, his statement was, uh, I can tell you this, Omaha looks a lot bigger on the way up than it does on the way down. Um, well, the Empire looked a lot bigger on the way up than it will look on the way down. But its days are numbered, and we might as well get used to it. Um, its days in the Middle East are numbered. Its days around the world are numbered. We can manage it. Uh, it could be done. I mean, we could, we could manage this destruction in such a way that it, did not, it does not have to run, ruin this entire country. What I'm talking about is the difference between a couple of years of pain and having your children build railroads in China. Uh, I'm serious. This, uh, this is serious business. You want your kids to be maids for the Chinese? Just keep going the same direction you're going. That's going to happen. Uh, and there's nothing we can do about it. See, this is the sad part. They're not going to change. None of these things that I just told you are actually going to happen. So what does that tell you? Well, uh, you know, uh, you've heard a lot of scripture. I, I guess it's a good thing to close on, but one of the things I've always had in my mind is that passage from Psalms that says, uh, why do the heathen rage and the nations imagine a vain thing? I used to think about that. But it seems obvious now to me. They rage because they're heathens, and they imagine the vain thing because they're vain. This is where we are as a world. So, in closing, as we go to lunch, let me just tell you that if you disagree with everything I just said, then just leave and, and pay me no mind. Forget I was even here. But if you agree with me, tell your family and your friends and everybody you care about. Thank you, folks. Yeah.